21. This is my daughter last year as well. She's 22. Oh, nice. Hi, Lauren. Hi, Lauren. She's probably not connected to the audio. Hi. Oh, hi. <laughs> hi, you guys. How are you? Hi. We just arrived, so I'm just gonna go get my um my things. Okay. Okay. How do you like New York? It's grown on me. <laughs> when when uh, school's over, you're gonna come move back to California, or? Yeah, at least the West Coast, if not California. Uh -huh. um, I want to do like bird ecology and conservation and all the things I want to study are in the West Coast. So I thought about you this weekend because um, we were up in um, uh, Utah and I saw a lot of, hi Kelly. Hi Kelly. I, saw, I kept seeing a lot of little birds. I'm like, yeah. that's such a pretty bird. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And I even tried taking pictures of one. I'm like, this is a terrible picture. I wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to identify it. <laughs> I, I, you'd be surprised. Sometimes you can figure it out from even a bad picture. I have a bird question, Diego. <laughs> yeah, what is it, Lauren? Um, I'm teaching in Chicago, and um, one of my friends who's a farmer there was saying that bird migration is a very potent and strong part of fall in the Great Lakes. Yeah. And I was wondering if you know any resources that helps people identify when what birds might be migrating over. Yeah, there's um, the best one is is if you go on the eBird website. Okay. Um, there's like a, they use radar to track bird migration, so you can go on a map and you can like click species, and it'll literally show you where they are, like when they arrive at certain places. Like they have, right. they have maps that show you like where they move at different times of year and, and they break it down by species and you can like see more than one at a time. And it, it, it that's where you should go is eBird website. It's really okay. good. Okay, and so it's eBird, eBird.com? Uh, maybe it's .org, but yeah, just look up Thank eBird. You. It should be the first thing that comes up. Thank you, I'm gonna go get my embroidery. Nice. I'm glad to know about that too, Diego. Actually. What's up, Kelly? Hi guys. So I'm just going by the seat of my pants this week a little. Same I didn't year. Do... <laughs> I didn't... It's fine, though, because we're in a flow. And this week's readings are great. We'll they just are. start with the um, free talk. We'll do the Macy, see where we're at with time, and maybe just stop there, depending. I, I, it's like hard. I just feel like I don't want us to go way over. I, I was thinking that um, I could... If you want me to do anything, I could wait till the end of the readings and then just pick one yeah. thing that, that we talked about. Yeah, exactly. Maybe just help kind of start the conversation. Yeah, that's great. I can thoughts, totally do that. You know, I'll mention the questions like usual and and we'll be just fine. Yeah, sweet. I'm here in Lone Pine. It's a windy windstorm with beautiful dramatic skies. I just saw the silo for the very first time on the oh, edge wow. of the lake, which is mind blowing. Wow. So the aesthetic, like just the, it's by itself on this huge dry lake bay. I don't know, it just, when you see Wait, it- Wait, is that lake, Owens Valley? Yeah, wow. yeah, Owens Valley. Yeah, Diego, you gotta come up here because- I really want to. Over the summer, if you guys ever go, I I'm really, and you can- yeah. Tolerate let's bringing me it. along. I'd definitely like to go. Yeah, let's do it next year for sure. Um, but yeah, so, and I just settled into a little farmhouse here. Nice. And the fall is really pretty there too. It is. The what is? Fall. The fall. Fall. Oh, yeah, I bet. I bet. We got or winter rain. or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We Any got rain. Except for the middle of the summer, I think it's good. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Yeah, that rain picture, I was, I was like, wow. And also, you guys, can you tell that I have a black eye? No, no. what happened? Okay, do you see sure. this eye compared to this? <laughs> oh, I guess now that Not you even. it out. I can't even really I'm see glad it. you guys can't notice it because I don't want people <laughs> to think I've been in a bar brawl. <laughs> what happened? Like, Were you in a bar an brawl? abusive lover, jealous lover or something. <laughs> You guys never, I mean, it's so silly. I woke up, I was staying with Lauren in Topanga. So it was like a new place for me, you know? And I woke up in the middle of the night and it's like, gotta go to the bathroom. And I just 
went head first into the corner of a wall. Like I, was, I, I went diagonal instead of left. You know, something happened. Wow. And, I was like, oh. Oh. and then I had edamame beans on it or, you know, frozen. Golly, that's but terrible. It's all good. It's all good. My, my boyfriend was making funny. He was like, do we need to get you a sleeping helmet, babe? <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> anyway, I'm a tough broad. I'm rocking the Rocky Balboa look. Oh, Emily, yeah. Emily from the studio is like, I'll just call you Rocky. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <sighs> but no, I can't tell at all. Okay, good. Yeah, neither can I. Lauren was saying that too. For me, I could, you know, because you know how you. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Exactly. Okay, what time is it? We're doing good. I thought I was later than I am. We're great. Awesome. I'll be My right friend back. made me this necklace today. It's a snake, like, Whoa. curled around on itself. Ooh. Awesome. Lauren's going to like that, too. What is it made out of? Is it, like, a bone? Like clay, like Sculpey clay. Mm. The kind that you can bake in the oven. Mm. Sounds like a cool friend. Yeah, I gave her a drawing, so she gave me oh, this. It's a her. Return. It's a her. Yeah. Mm. yeah, no, you know, this being recorded, I, I wish, but it's, it's not in the cards. <laughs> well, you never know, Diego. You're quite. I, funny. I'm pretty sure that she has a nice girlfriend who I oh. can't really compete with. I don't want to compete with. Oh. Otherwise, I would. <laughs> But she's a good friend. That's awesome. Okay. God, look at Lauren's great view. Maybe I oh, should. Oh, it's beautiful. I just like the light. So um, just quickly, just to touch base uh, our flow, I'll continue with the embroidery of the week, the popcorn share, then I'll do the embroidery video, the intro, and then pass it to you, Kelly, and you'll do the readings, introduce the readings, then we'll screen share, open discussion, current events and closing thoughts you got it girl like on the back of your hand it's on my other computer screen <laughs> it's actually literally <laughs> on the, the only thing i need to remember is to mention the the guiding questions i forgot that last time and i was just appalled i was shocked and appalled i just <laughs> There's always the chat bar. There's always the chat Kelly, bar. Kelly. <laughs> Just being dramatic. I had a a teacher when I was young who would say, I'm shocked and appalled. And so it's like <laughs> a joke for me. But anyway. Okay, I'm being recorded. I'm gonna go get some water up your back. Okay. This is not the first time that the <laughs> Metabolic archives have had my misfortune with girls saved on them. <laughs> <laughs> we won't post it. Thank you. <laughs> Better not see it on Instagram. <laughs> I'm gonna quickly feed all of a little more dinner. I've been doing it in small increments and she just came asking for it. So that's what you're gonna hear. Aw. Hurry up and eat, we're about to go out. Oh, Cindy, before I forget, um, a couple of people said that they were going to, like, Ansu was one of the people that, that emailed me. Um, she's going to be coming in on her car, but switching to her phone, so there might be a point where she, like, logs out and logs back in. Okay. And um, and then Marianne had indicated something like she may or may not, you know, going to try to make it work. So there might be some, like, strange numbers. Yeah, so... Um, if, yeah. if it's obviously not their name, we'll just go for it and just watch the door and I'm sure it's fine, but um, okay. just so you know. Thank you. That's the update for me. The update for me is I put the first thread through the mycelial network of my embroidery. Right on. I'm loving, I'm loving it. 
we'll right. be looking forward to seeing that. I'm going to complete. And I have it with me here all the way in Lone Pine from Seattle to Lone Pine. <laughs> so let me get it out. <clears throat> Kelly, do you know how far that is from the bristlecone pines? Ooh, good question, Diego. I don't know. You should ask Lauren, or unless Jen, you know. Over the summer, I drove through an area that I thought was called something like Lone Pine or something, but it was just for like less than an hour driving through and there was a sign that said like this way to historic <laughs> bristlecone pine forest. Wow, yes. That's, that's very close to here. Oh, there's Lauren. Oh, yeah. is it, is it? Yeah, bristlecone, like we're, we're um, like a half hour drive from the turnoff on the 395. Oh my gosh, then that's totally where I was, was yeah. Lone Pine over the summer. I, I, I just drove through there, but I saw that bristlecone sign on the turnoff. Yeah. How yeah. far was it again, Lauren, that, to go visit it from here? Just curious. Um, well, it's basically to the Bristlecone Forest. It's probably two hours. Uh huh. Because wow. once you turn off the road, you go on a very, very windy road to pretty high up. Mm -hmm. And it's the oldest trees in the world. Yes. I want to go there. I have to go there sometime. We should all make a pilgrimage sometime. Absolutely. You know? Please we'll bring me. While you're up here, we can we can do that. I would love that, Lauren. We I could would. Do that Saturday. That would be amazing. Seems like a good 9/11 activity. Yeah, yeah. The longest surviving beings. Everything seems yeah, smaller. Um, okay. Cool. I'm getting my guiding questions. Do we do we want to push to get through all three readings, Lauren? How are you feeling on fatigue levels and time? I'm With fine. Okay. Okay. We'll take a little break after the first two, and then we'll, you know, maybe see how we do. That's right. my question. Yeah. The last one is good, but it was more confusing to me. But I didn't give it enough full attention, so it may come through this time. Okay. Okay, are we ready to uh, let people in? Yep. All right. Hello everyone and welcome to Metalbox Studio Learning and Mending. Um, as we all start to come into the Zoom this evening, I'm going to start off with the embroidery of the week. And I was so excited to get this because it's a totally different technique and I am excited to share with you Caroline's design and she actually felted her um, horse weed. So, um, but I thought it was just so cool because it's, it's just so beautiful in the detail that, that she maintained. And it kind of builds upon last week's with um, Naveen and how she was taking and doing like kind of an applique effect with the, the material. And I just thought this was a really unique and creative way to approach her embroidery. So that's the embroidery of the week. Um, I'm Jen. And I use she, her pronouns, and I'm with Metabox Studio, and I'm, I'm calling in from Studio City. And tonight I will be working on finishing, I think, my mycelium network carbon exchange. I, it, it feels like it's getting there, but you know how you still feel like, well, maybe I'll go a little bit further. So I might go a little bit further, but um, I'm very excited about it. And um, now I will pass it on to someone else and we'll just do quick introductions before we begin while we wait for everybody to settle in. And so I will pass it to Dee. Hi, Derainer Holland calling in from Baldwin Hills. I go by she, her pronoun. And I am starting on this. I'm not sure what it is, but 
I'll be starting on this tonight. Um, and I will pass it on to Kavi. Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, Kavi Law calling in from Sacramento. I use he, him pronouns. Uh, and let's see, this week, uh, working on some, just some geometry or, uh, I don't know how it works, but. <laughs> Well, just screwing with some lines <laughs> and uh, really looking forward to tonight's session as well. Um, I'll pass it on to Andrea. Hello, Andrea is she, her pronouns. I'm calling from Mid-City Windsor Square and I'm working on this piece. I got one little dot last week, so I'm very proud of myself. In the meantime, I watched a beginner embroidery lesson on YouTube today. So might know a new stitch now, the back stitch, which you guys probably already all know. And um, yeah, excited for the lesson. And I will pass to Cindy. Hi, I'm Cindy. Um, I am calling in from West Covina today. And I go by her she pronouns. Um, I'm still I haven't gotten very far on the underground pattern that I have, but uh, I'll keep working on that tonight. Um, and I will pass it on to Izzy. Hi everyone, I'm Izzy. Um, I'm calling in from East Hollywood. My pronouns are they, she, and tonight I'm going to uh, be listening and I have an embroidery that's in a drawer that I have to go grab. I don't have it with me right this second, but yes, it's one of the underground series. And I will pass it on to um, Michelle. Hi everyone, I'm Michelle from uh, Highland Park, pronoun uh, he, him. Um, I'm working on, on, Pretending I, I'm, I'm applying um, embroidery techniques to drawings. So I'm doing this. Um, so it has no flat surface, it's just lines. And uh, I'm jealous of my colleagues who do a lot of uh, microscope work and get to see uh, incredible life under their lens. So I'm doing my own. And I will give the microphone to... Um, uh, I don't have original view, so I don't know who's there. Uh, let's see, um, uh, Emily. Thanks, Mish. Hi, everyone. Emily here in Echo Park neighborhood of Los Angeles with my interspecies crew, Bucky and Lulu. And right now I'm working on some ice cream and I will be listening uh, intently to the text that you guys explore. And I'm happy to be with you. So let me pass it on to champion of the stage and screen and sound, Miss Olan Jones. Thank you, thank you all. <laughs> uh, yes, I am Olan, I'm in West Hollywood. I use she, her pronouns. I am working on this underground extravaganza and looking forward to where we go in the readings tonight. And I will pass this on to Marianne. Thank you. Hello, I'm Marianne. I'm in the Silver Lake neighborhood of Los Angeles. And I am also working on the underground. And I'm having fun using two different colors in my stitching and finding a way to get there. It's taking some time. Great to be here. And let's see, I don't have everyone in front of me. Lauren, have you spoken? No, hi. Hi. Uh, Lauren, I'm uh, exploring she, they pronouns. Um, I'm calling in from Paya Hunadu, and um, 
I am working on figuring out how to do embroidery with no thread or a needle. Um, <laughs> I, I brought my embroidery, but apparently no thread or a needle. So that'll be my project tonight. I'm glad to be with you all. And I would love to hear from Ansu. Hi, everyone. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, good. Yeah. I uh, have my hands on the wheel, and I'm somewhere on Route 105. So I'm calling in from the, uh, the mobile, you know, coach here. <laughs> but uh, really happy to be uh, joining you from the road and look forward to listening in tonight. Um, would would Jen? Would you mind passing it on to somebody for me so that I I don't have to look down too much? Absolutely, I will Thank pass. It, I will pass it on to Rowena. Hello, everyone. I'm Rowena Koenig. I'm in Los Angeles. I use she/her pronouns. Tonight, I'm working on this hermit thrush. So very much in the air elements, but admiring all of the underground earth work that's going on as well. Nice to see everyone. I will pass it to let's see who hasn't gone. Kelly, have you gone? Nope, I haven't gone. Um, I'm Kelly, uh, she, her pronouns. I am in Lone Pine and I am working on the second thread to my mycelium network, which I'm very excited about. I just love this one. And I love the underground things that we're doing. They're just really unique um, and have deep metaphorical significance. As I threaded this, I was thinking about how the mycelium was connecting everything underground and it was just great. So. Um, so that's what's going on with me. Let's see. Do we want to keep popcorning, Jen? Should we Actually, do? I was going to take it back from you. Thank you. Um, I will share right now a time lapse um, video, and it's called Thread Painting of Realistic Animals. And I, I thought it was really a beautiful video. Uh, so I will share that with you right now. Let me get that up and running. Okay. Can everybody see it? Okay. And so that actually reminded me of a lot of the stuff that I've seen people turning in. I thought it was just so extraordinary, like the bee and the um, the raven. I just thought it might be inspiring to somebody to do different details. Um, so the Metabox Studios Learning and Mending series is now in its fifth iteration. In this series, from micro to macro, we will be exploring the implications of an integrated form of systems thinking that allows us to think across all scales, from particle, cell, brain, society, ecosystem, to cosmic matter. From micro to macro, we'll build upon what we learned about from Anna Singh's disturbance ecology and have an emphasis on complexity, networks, and patterns of organization. Many of you have received embroidery kits from us of native plants, birds, and microscopic organism, organisms that the Metabolic Studio 
is currently cultivating on its project sites. Taken as a collection, all of these embroideries will collectively illustrate biogeochoanosis, which describes the intimate association between living things and the physical environment. If you've not received an embroidery kit or you would like another one, please send your name and mailing address to info at metabolicstudio.org. Tonight, we will share our screen and we encourage you to read a section of the text aloud with us. When there is a pause in the reading, please feel free to unmute yourself and begin where the last person left off. Silence is golden and there is no pressure to fill the transitional spaces while we enjoy a breath and continue crafting. Feel free to jump in and continue reading at your comfort level. You don't have to read, it's also fine to enjoy listening. And now I will pass it over to Kelly where she will introduce tonight's readings. Thank you, Jen. And that video was particularly beautiful. Like, you know, the seeing all the different insect patterns that you can make, I loved yeah. it. Um, okay, so tonight I'm actually very excited about our readings. They're focused on organizations, power and leadership. And that might not sound very exciting, but I love the lens through which these things are looked at um, in some of the readings tonight. Um, the first one is again from Fritov Capra, who's been with us a lot throughout this series and his systems view of life. Um, and he really takes an interesting look at organizations and as a kind of a unique living system form of a living system. Obviously, you know, we're living beings interacting. And so thinking about how organizations of human beings can be more or less open to change and like emergent of new ideas. So uh, it's kind of a nice uh, inquiry into how organizations and maybe even bureaucratic organizations might be able to open up to change <laughs> over time. Um, and then we have another reading from Active Hope. Um, Joanna Macy and Chris Johnstone um, wrote those that book and I've been really happy to revisit it because it has so many tools to um, help us psychologically and um, collectively work, keep working toward fighting the good fight and not give up, um, see ourselves as part of a, a kind of a collective power. And so she talks a lot about how our, our small actions are part of larger movements that we need to keep in our mind's eye. Um, to help us with our inspiration and motivation. And so that's a really nice reading. And then if we have time, we have a reading again from Mina Salam, Salami, Salami. Um, Sensuous Knowledge is the book uh, that that reading is from. Um, just to remind you, Mina is a, a Finnish Nigerian journalist who uh, writes a lot about African feminist issues. And so in this reading, she talks about how the co very concept of power has been really dominated by patriarchal and then capitalist kind of frameworks that ha have kind of kept it uh, hostage and that there's other forms of power that we should be also recognizing and talking about. So those are our three readings for tonight. And I have a couple um, questions for you guys. Uh, I thought I put them right here, but I didn't. Uh, one second. Guiding questions. Okay. I'll put these in the chat. So the first guiding question is, in what ways can organizations, quote, have a willingness to be disturbed? This will make more sense. In order to create space for nonlinear emergence or change, basically. Um, the second question is, in what ways can we cultivate a power with mentality um, within our own communities of practice? And then the last one is, what are some of the larger social movements that the seemingly small actions that you are part of um, are connected to? So I will put these in the chat and then I think we're going to pass it over to Diego, which will kick us off with the free top Capra reading. Um, it says host disabled participant screen sharing. There we go. Thanks. 
Sorry about that. Life and leadership in organizations, complexity and change. In the social sciences, the system's view of life has found its greatest advocates in management science. In recent years, the nature of human organizations has been discussed extensively in business and management circles in response to a widespread feeling that today's busyness businesses need to undergo a fundamental transformation to adapt to a new global business and organizational environment that is almost unrecognizable from the point of view of traditional management theory and practice. Wheatley and Kellner Rogers, moreover, a growing number of business leaders are becoming aware that our complex industrial systems, both organizational and technological, are the main driving force of global environmental destruction and need to be fundamentally reorganized to become ecologically sustainable. This double challenge, the complexity of today's business environment and the need to become ecologically sustainable is urgent and real and the recent extensive discussions of organizational change or change management are fully justified. However, in spite of these extensive discussions and some anecdotal evidence of successful attempts to transform organizations, the overall track record seems to be very poor. In recent surveys, CEOs reported again and again that their efforts at organizational change did not yield the promised results. Instead of managing new, ex new organizations, they ended up managing the unwanted side effects of their efforts. From the system's point of view, it is evident that one of the main obstacles to organizational change today is the largely unconscious embraced by business leaders of the me mechanistic approach to management. The principles of classical management theory are so deeply ingrained in the ways we think about organizations that for most managers, the design of formal structures linked by clear lines of communication, coordination, and control has become almost second nature. The core problem seems to be a confusion arising from the dual nature of all human organizations. On the one hand, they are social institutions designed for specific purposes, such as making money for their shareholders, managing the distribution of political power, transmitting knowledge or spreading religious faith. At the same time, organizations are communities of people who interact with one another to build relationships, help each other and make their daily activities meaningful on a, at a personal level. These two aspects of organizations correspond to two very different types of change. Many CEOs are disappointed about their efforts to achieve change, in large part because they see their company as a well-designed tool for achieving specific purposes. And when they attempt to change its design, they want predictable, quantifiable change in the entire structure. However, the designed structure always intersects with the organization's living individuals and communities for whom change cannot be designed. It's common to hear that people in organizations resist change. In reality, people do not resist change. They resist 
having change imposed on them. Being alive, individuals and their communities are both stable and subject to change and development, but their natural change processes are very different from the organizational changes designed by re-engineering experts and mandated from the top. From our perspective of the system's view of life, it seems that in order to resolve the problem of organizational change, we first need to understand the natural change processes that are embedded in all living systems. Once we have that understanding, we can begin to design processes of organizational change accordingly and to create human organizations that mirror life's adaptability, diversity, and creativity. As we have learned from the theory of autopoiesis, living systems continually create or recreate themselves by transforming or replacing their components. They undergo continual structural changes while preserving their web-like patterns of organization. Understanding life means understanding its inherent change processes. It seems, therefore, that organizational change will appear in a new light when we understand clearly to what extent and in what ways human organizations are alive. Indeed, a number of organizational theorists have taken this approach in recent years. Communities of practice. Living social systems, as we have seen, are self-generating networks of communications. This means that a human organization will be a living system only if it is organized as a network or contains smaller networks within its boundaries. Indeed, organizational theorists have come to realize that informal social networks exist within every organization. They arise from various alliances and friendships, informal channels of communication, and other tangled webs of relationships that continually grow, change, and adapt to new situations. The social learning theorist Etienne Wenger has coined the term communities of practice for these informal self-generating networks within organizations. Wenger points out that in our daily activities, most of us belong to several communities of practice at work, in schools, in sports and hobbies, or in civic life. Some of them may have explicit names and formal structures. Others may be so informal that they're not even identified as communities. Whatever their status, communities of practice are an integral part of our lives. As far as human organizations are concerned, we can now see that their dual nature as legal and economic entities on the one hand and communities of people on the other hand derives from the fact that various communities of practice invariably arise and develop within the organization's formal structures. Within every organization, there is a cluster of interconnected communities of practice. The more people are engaged in these informal networks and the more developed and sophisticated the networks are, the better will the organization be able to learn, respond creatively to unexpected new circumstances, change and evolve. In other words, the organization's aliveness resides in its communities of practice. The living organization. In order to maximize a company's creative potential and learning capabilities, it is crucial for managers and business leaders to understand the interplay between the organization's formal design structures and its informal self-generating networks. The formal structures are sets of rules and regulations that define relationships between people and tasks and determine the distribution of power. Boundaries are established by contractual agreements that delineate well-defined subsystems or departments and functions. The formal structures are depicted in the organization's official documents, the organizational charts, bylaws, manuals, and budgets that describe the organization's formal policies, strategies, and procedures. The informal structures, by contrast, are fluid and fluctuating networks of communications. These communications include nonverbal forms of mutual engagement in a joint enterprise through which skills are exchanged and shared, through which skills are exchanged and shared tacit knowledge is generated. The shared practice creates flexible boundaries of meaning that are often unspoken. The distinction of belonging to a network may be as simple as being able to follow certain conversations or knowing the latest gossip. Informal networks of communications are embodied in the people who engage in the common practice. When new people join, the entire network may reconfigure itself. When people leave, the network will change again or may even break down. 
In the formal organization, by contrast, functions and power relations are more important than people, persisting over the years while people come and go. We should also note that not all informal networks are fluid and self-generating. For example, the well-known old boys networks are informal patriarchal structures that can be very rigid and may exert considerable power. When we speak of informal structures in the following paragraphs, we refer to continually self-generating networks of communications or communities of practice. In every organization, there is a continuous interplay between its informal networks and its formal structures. Formal policies and procedures are always filtered and modified by the informal networks, which allow workers to use their creativity when faced with unexpected and novel situations. The power of this interplay becomes strikingly apparent when employees engage in a, quote, work to rule protest. By working strictly according to the official manuals and procedures, they seriously impair the organization's functioning. Ideally, the formal organization recognizes and supports its informal networks of relationships and incorporates their innovations into its structures. To repeat, the aliveness of an organization, its flexibility, creative potential, and learning capability resides in its informal communities of practice. The formal parts of the organization may be, quote, alive to varying degrees, depending on how closely they are in touch with their informal networks. Experienced managers know how to work with the informal organization. They will typically let the formal structures handle the routine work and rely on the informal organization to help with tasks that go beyond the usual routine. They may also communicate critical information to certain people, knowing that it will be passed around and discussed through the informal channels. These considerations imply that the most effective way to enhance an organization's potential for creativity and learning, to keep it vibrant and alive, is to support and strengthen its communities of practice. The first step in this endeavor will be to provide the social space for informal communications to flourish. The more managers know about the detailed processes involved in self-generating social networks, the more effective they will be in working with the organization's communities of practice. Let us see then what kind of lessons for management can be derived from the systemic understanding of life. According to the Santiago theory of cognition, a living network responds to disturbances with structural changes, and it chooses both which disturbances to notice and how to respond. What people notice depends on who they are as individuals and on the cultural characteristics of their communities of practice. A message will get through to them not only because of its volume or frequency, but also because of its, excuse me, but also because of its meaning <laughs> only because of the, but also because it is meaningful to them excuse me a message will get through to them not only because of its volume or frequency but also because it is meaningful to them we are dealing with here with a crucial difference between a living system and a machine a machine can be controlled a living system can only be disturbed this implies that human organizations cannot be controlled through direct interventions but they can be influenced by giving impulses rather than instructions. To change the conventional style of management accordingly requires a shift of perception that is anything but easy, but it also brings great rewards. Working with the processes inherent in living systems means that we do not need to spend a lot of energy to move an organization. There is no need to push, pull, or bully it to make it change. Force or energy is not the issue. The issue is meaning. Meaningful disturbances will get the organization's attention and will trigger structural changes. Off offering impulses and guiding principles rather than strict instructions evidently amounts to significant changes in power relations, changes from domination and control to cooperation and partnerships. This too is a fundamental implication of the new understanding of life. As we mentioned in our chapter on evolution, biologists and ecologists have come to realize that most relationships between organisms and nature are essentially cooperative ones. The tendency to associate, establish links, cooperate and maintain symbiotic relationships is one of the hallmarks of life. 
In terms of our previous discussion of power in section 14.4.3, we could say that the shift from domination to partnership corresponds to a shift from coercive power, which uses threat of sanctions to ensure adherence to orders and compensatory power, which offers financial incentives and rewards to conditioned power, which tries to make instructions meaningful through persuasion and education. Emergence and design. If the aliveness of an organization resides in its communities of practice, and if creativity, learning, change, and development are inherent in all living systems, how do these processes actually manifest themselves in the organization's living networks and communities? To answer this question, we need to turn to a key characteristic of life that we discussed in chapter eight, the spontaneous emergence of new order. As we showed with many examples, emergent properties are ubiquitous in chemistry. An emergence acquires its full potential in dynamical systems that operate far from equilibrium. There, the phenomenon of emergence takes place at critical points of instability that arise from fluctuations in the environment, amplified by feedback loops. Emergence results in the creation of novelty that is often qualitatively different from the phenomenon of which it came. The constant generation of novelty, nature's creative advance, as the philosopher Alfred North Whitehead called it, is a key property of all living systems. In a human organization, the event triggering the process of emergence may be an offhand comment, which may not even seem important to the person who made it, but it is meaningful to some people in the community of practice. Because it is meaningful to them, they choose to be disturbed and circulate the information rapidly through the organization's networks. As it circulates through various feedback loops, the information may get amplified and expanded, even to such an extent that the organization can no longer absorb it in its present state. When that happens, a point of instability has been reached. The system cannot integrate the new information into its existing order, and it is forced to abandon some of its structures, behaviors, or beliefs. The result is a state of chaos, confusion, uncertainty, and doubt. And out of that chaotic state, a new form of order organized around a new meaning emerges. The new order was not designed by any individual, but emerged as a result of the organization's collective creativity. This process of emergence involves several distinct stages. To begin with, there must be a certain openness within the organization, a willingness to be disturbed in order to set the process in motion. And there has to be active network of communications with multiple feedback loops to amplify the triggering event. The next stage is the point of instability, which may be experienced as tension, chaos, uncertainty, or crisis. At this stage, the system may either break down or it may break through to a new state of order, which is characterized by novelty and involves an experience of creativity that often feels like magic. Since the process of emergence is thoroughly nonlinear, involving multiple feedback loops, it cannot be fully analyzed with our conventional linear ways of reasoning, and hence we tend to experience it with a sense of mystery. Throughout the living world, the creativity of life expresses itself through the process of emergence. The structures that are created in this process 
biological structures of living organisms, as well as many social structures in human communities may appropriately be called, quote, emergent structures. Before the evolution of humans, all living structures on the planet were emergent structures. With human evol evolution, language, conceptual thought, and all the other characteristics of reflective consciousness came into play. This enabled us to form a mental images, form mental images of physical objects, to formulate goals and strategies, and thus create structures by design. We sometimes speak of the structural, quote, design of a blade of grass or an insect's wing. But in doing so, we use metaphorical language. These structures were not designed. Rather, they were formed during the evolution of life and survived through natural selection. They are emergent structures. Design requires the ability to form mental images and since this ability, as far as we know, is limited to humans and the great apes, there is no design in, in nature at large. Human organizations always contain both designed and emergent structures. The designed structures are the formal structures of the organization as described in its official documents. The emergent structures are created by the organization's informal networks and communities of practice. The two types of structures are very different as we have seen, and every organization needs both kinds. Design structures provide the rules and routines that are necessary for effective functioning of the organization. Design structures provide stability. Emergent structures, on the other hand, provide novelty, creativity, and flexibility. They are adaptive, capable of changing and evolving. In today's complex business environment, purely designed structures do not have the necessary responsiveness and learning capability. The issue is not one of discarding, designed, discarding design structures in favor of emergent ones. We need both. In every human organization, there is a tension between its designed structures, which, which embody relationships of power, and its emergent structures, which represent the organization's aliveness and creativity. Skillful, ma skillful managers understand the interdependence of design and emergence. They know that in today's turbulent business environment, their challenge is to find the right balance between the creativity of emergence and the stability of design. Concluding remarks. Bringing life into human organizations by empowering their communities or practice not only increases our flexibility, creativity, and learning potential, but also enhances the dignity and humanity of the organization's individuals as they connect with those qualities in themselves. In other words, the focus on life and self-organization empowers the self. It creates mentality and emotionally healthy working environments in which People feel that they are supported in striving to achieve their own goals and do not have to sacrifice their integrity to meet the goals of the organization. The problem is that, that human organizations are not only living communities, but also social institutions designed for specific purposes and functioning in a specific economic environment. Today, that environment is not life enhancing, but is increasingly life destroying. The more we understand the nature of life and become aware of how alive an organization can be, the more painfully we notice the life draining nature of our current economic system. When shareholders and other outside bodies assesses the health of a business organization, they generally do not inquire about the aliveness of its communities, the integrity and well being of its employees, or the ecological sustainability of its products. They ask about profits, shareholder value, market share, and other economic parameters. And they will also uh, they will apply any pressure they can to ensure quick returns on their investments. 
irrespective of the long-term consequences for the organization, the well-being of its employees, and of the broader social environmental impacts. It is evident that key characteristics of today's business environment, the global competition, turbulent market, and corporate mergers with uh, corporate mergers with rapid structural changes, increasing workloads, and demands of the 24 accessibility 24/7 accessibility combine to create a situation that is highly stressful and profoundly unhealthy. In this business climate, it is often difficult to hold on to the vision of an organization that is alive, creative, and concerned about the well-being of its members and of the living world at large. Paradoxically, the current business environment, which is turbulence and complexities, is also one in which the flexibility, creativity, and learning capability that come with the organization's aliveness are most needed. This is now being recognized by a growing number of visionary business leaders who are shifting their priorities toward developing the creative potential of their employees, enhancing the quality of the company's internal communities, and integrating the challenges of ecological sustainability into their strategies. In the long run, organizations that are truly alive will be able to flourish only when we change our economic system so that it becomes life enhancing rather than life destroying. The systemic understanding of life makes it clear that in the coming years, such a change will be imperative not only for the well being of human organizations, but also for the survival and sustainability of humanity as a whole. This is the subject of the last three chapters of the book. That's it for that one. Good job, Kavi took us through. Yeah, so I think the next one, I think we'll just head right into it, um, is from Joanna Macy and Active Hope. So, um, I can read a little. Active Hope, How to Face the Mess We're In Without Going Crazy, Chapter 6. A different kind of power <clears throat> from our wider identity as part of the living earth comes a strong urge to hmm, act. <laughs> Yet while pain from the world alerts us to the urgency of our situation, we may still view planetary crisis as beyond our power to affect. In a recent large scale survey, the Mental Health Foundation found that a feeling of powerlessness was by far the most common response to global issues. Footnote somewhere. Joe, a student blogging on the web, expressed his experience of this. It seems to me that climate change is something only industrial and political leaders have any real power to solve. If we're honest, the idea that individuals like me can really contribute to a solution seems laughable. Am I wrong to think this way? Am I giving up? In seeing power is held only by those at the top of the hierarchy, Joe is expressing a view that is widespread and that undermines our capacity to act. When we see with new eyes, we discover a different way of perceiving and experiencing power. Before we move on to exploring this discovery, we need to first describe the old view of power and the problems it brings. <clears throat> the old view of power. In the old story, power is based on a position of dominance or advantage over others, a position that secures privileged access to resources and influence. This type of power is about getting your way and having others do what you want. The bottom line here is being able to win in a conflict. The more you can beat others, the higher you rise. We refer to this type of power as power See where it leads. Feelings of powerlessness are widespread. Power over is based on a win-lose model. In the contest to come out on top, most of us end up losing. The position of being in power is such a small space that only a few people can fit there. 
leaving many feeling, as Joe the blogger expressed, that the idea that individuals like me can really contribute to a solution seems laughable. While we may be able to get our own way in some areas of our personal life, there is a limit to what we, as, what we see as within our power. Because global issues are usually considered far beyond this, we may view, our, may view thinking about them, we may view thinking about them as a waste of time. For example, an expression we've often heard is, there's no point worrying about things you can't change and you can't change the world. Power is viewed as a commodity. What gives a person or position of advantage, a position of advantage over others? It is having something that others do not, whether it may be money, weapons, material resources, contacts, or information. When information gives advantage, it becomes a tradable asset. As a result, valuable knowledge gets hidden away and public awareness is held back by secrecy. Even votes in elections are thought of as viable, with campaign funds dependent on huge donations and invested interest groups expect favors in return. The power to shape the direction of our society has become a commodity to be bought and sold. When power is a possession to be held, defended, and accumulated, it becomes increasingly removed from the hands of ordinary people. Power generates conflict. Power over is essentially oppositional because gaining it involves taking it away from others. To rise up, either as an individual or as a group, you need to push others down. To get in power, you need to push others out. As those pushed down and out are left with resentment, those in power then need to keep tabs on the opposition and stop them from becoming powerful enough to present a threat. Fear is intrinsic to this model of power. Even if and when you are on top, you have to be vigilant lest you lose the upper hand. In the struggle to stay on top, ruthlessness and dishonesty have become so common that the link between power and corruption is often seems seen as inevitable. Dominance gives privilege access to resources and to maintain dominance, huge amounts are spent on being strong, that is able to win a fight. In 2010, the global arms expenditure was $1.6 trillion. For perspective, spending 10% of this annually could eliminate extreme poverty and starvation throughout the world. Pass. Power fosters mental rigidity. When displays of strength are seen as important, changing one's mind is viewed as giving in, as a sign of weakness. In political discussions, winning is valued more highly than deepening understanding. This standpoint blocks openness to new information and stifles the flexibility needed to deal with changing circumstances. Power becomes suspect. When completing the sentence, powerful people tend to be, our workshop participants often reveal mixed feelings about becoming powerful, identifying both appealing and unappealing qualities. While they view powerful people as passionate, clear, determined, and brave, they also view them as more likely to be lonely, stabbed in the back, dishonest, and disliked. This mixed picture presents a dilemma for those wanting to find the power to make the difference in the world, but not wanting to enter a battleground where they are likely to become distrusted, lonely, or corrupted. Suspicion of power leads people to be reluctant to act authoritatively. Many have become disillusioned with mainstream politics. Witness the low turnout at elections in many democracies. Fortunately, the power over model isn't the only way to understand power. When we see with new eyes, a more attractive and capacity building alternative comes into view. A 
a new story of power. The word power comes from the Latin posere, meaning to be able. The kind of power we will now focus on is not about dominating others, but about being able to address the mess we're in. Rather than being based on how much stuff or status we have, this view of power is rooted in insights and practices, in strengths and relationships, in compassion and connection with the web of life. One person who has embraced the collaborative model of power is Nelson Mandela. In the early 1980s, the apartheid government of South Africa had a highly trained army with advanced weaponry and nuclear missiles. Mandela, representing the African National Congress, ANC, had been in prison for more than 20 years. While many feared it might take a civil war to end it, apartheid didn't end because of victory in battle. Rather, the transformation came about through discussion and agreement. For that process to start, it needed, as Mandela put it, jaw, 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 not war, war, war. In his autobiography, Long Walk to Freedom, he describes coming to a decision to move this process forward while in solitary confinement. My solitude gave me a certain liberty and I resolved to use it to do something I had been pondering for a long time, begin discussions with the government. This would be extremely sensitive. Both sides regarded discussions as a sign of weakness and betrayal. Neither would come to the table until the other made significant concessions. Someone from our side needed to take the first step. When we respond to a situation in a way that promotes healing and transformation, we are expressing power. Mandela's contributions to establishing a multiracial democracy in South Africa offer a, a wonderfully inspiring example. Because Mandela didn't have the, the authorization of the ANC's organizing committee, beginning talks with the enemy could have been seen as betrayal or as selling out. Taking this first step for peace took courage, determination, and foresight. Inner strengths like these are often thought of as things some people just have and others don't. These qualities, however, are linked to skills we can develop and practice and practices we can learn. Thinking of courage and determination as things we do rather than things we have helps us to develop these qualities. They emerge out of our engagement with actual situations and the dynamics that arise from our interactions. This approach is relational and we call it power with. One plus one equals two and a bit. The discussions Mandela undertook were effective because both sides recognized that they stood to lose by going to war and that they would gain by finding a way to peace. They moved from a win-lose model of conflict to one aiming for a win-win outcome. The alternative to negotiations was likely to be a war in which both sides lost. Power with is based on synergy where two or more parties working together bring results that would have not occurred if they had if they'd worked alone. Because something new and different emerges, emerges out of the interaction, we can think of it as a one plus one equals two and a bit. This is another way of saying the whole is more than the sum of the parts. Emergence and synergy lie right at the heart of power with. They generate new possibilities and capacities, adding a mystery element that means we can never be certain how a situation will go just from looking at the elements within it. We can know the strength of copper and tin, yet still be surprised how much stronger bronze is, which comes from mixing the two together. The same thing can happen when we interact with others for a shared purpose. D.H. Lawrence wrote, Water is H2O, hydrogen two parts, oxygen one. But there, but there is also a third thing that makes it water, and nobody knows what that is. 
One place we can experience synergy is in conversion. If both sides have the courage and willingness to explore new ground, talking and listening to one another can open a creative space from which new possibilities emerge. That's what happened in the negotiations between Mandela and F.W.D. Kirk, Clerk, the South African president at the time. This unlikely duo jointly won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1993 for their extraordinary feat of navigating towards a peaceful settlement. Emergence. While the conversation between Mandela and de Klerk played a pivotal role in bringing apartheid to an end, this historic change wouldn't have happened without a much larger context of support. Within South Africa, people risked their lives daily to engage in the struggle for change. Around the world, millions of people played supporting roles by joining boycotts and campaigns. If we focus only on each separate activity, it is easy to dismiss it by thinking. That won't do much. To see the power of a step, we need to ask what it is, what is it part of? An action that might seem in, inconsequential by itself adds to and interacts with other actions in ways that contribute to much bigger picture of change. Remember our example of the newspaper photograph? When seen under a magnifying glass, it appears as just a collection of tiny dots. But when from a little distance, we see the photo as a whole, the larger pattern comes into view. In a similar fashion, a bigger picture of change emerges out of many tiny dots of separate actions and choices. This link between small steps, big changes, opens up our power in an entirely new way. Each individual step doesn't have to make an, a big impact on its own because we can understand that the benefit of an action may not be visible at the level at which that action is taken. Shared visions, value, and purposes flow through and between people. Nelson Mandela was deeply committed to a vision for his country that many were holding the power of that vision moved through him and was transmitted to others. This type of power can't be handed or held back by prison walls. It is like a kind of electricity that lights us up inside and inspires those around us. When a vision moves through us, it becomes expressed in what we do, how we are, and what we say. The alignment of these three creates a whole that is more than some of its parts. The words below from Mandela's defense at his trial, <clears throat> at his trial in the 1960s, mean so much more because of the actions that followed them. During my lifetime, I have dedicated myself to the struggle of the African people. I have fought against white denomination and have fought against black denomination. I have cherished the ideal of a democratic and a free society in which all persons live together in harmony with equal opportunities. It is an ideal which I hope to live for and to achieve, but if needs be, it is an ideal for which I am prepared to die. The Power of Emergence. 
The concept of power width contains hidden depths. So far, we've described four aspects. First, there is the power of inner strengths drawn from us when we engage with challenges and rise to the occasion. Second, there is the power arising out of cooperation with others. Third, there is the subtle power of small steps whose impact only becomes evident when we step back and see the larger picture they contribute to. And last, there is the energizing power of an inspiring vision that moves through and strengthens us when we act for a purpose bigger than ourselves. All these are products of synergy and emergence. They come about when different elements interact to become a whole that is more than the sum of its parts. At every level, from atoms and molecules to cells, organs, and organisms, complex wholes arise, bringing new capacities into existence. At each level, the whole acts through its parts to achieve more than we could ever imagine from examining the parts alone. So what new capacities emerge when groups or people, groups of people or people can see that, act together to form a large, larger complex social systems? Our technologically advanced society has achieved wonders our ancestors could never have envisioned. We've put people on the moon, decoded DNA, and cured diseases. The problem is this collective level of power is also destroying our world. Countless seemingly innocent activities and choices are acting together to bring about the sixth mass extinction in our planet's history. Seeing with new eyes, we recognize that we're not separate individuals in our own little bubbles, but connected parts in a much larger story. A question that helps us develop this wider view is, what is happening through me? Is the sixth mass extinction happening through us as a result of our habits, choices, and actions? By recognizing the ways we contribute to the unraveling of our world, we identify choice points at which we can turn towards its healing. The question, how could the great turning happen through me, invites a different story to flow through us. This type of power happens through our choices, through what we say and do and are. Not needing to know the outcome. The concept of emergence is liberating because it frees us from the need to see the results of our actions. Many of our planet's problems, such as climate change, mass starvation, and habitat loss, are so much bigger than we are that it is easy to believe we are wasting our time trying to solve them. If we depend on seeing the positive results of our individual steps, we'll avoid challenges that seem beyond what we can visibly influence. Yet our actions take effect through such multiplicities of synergy that we can't trace their causal chain. Everything we do has ripples of influence extending far beyond what we can see. When we face a problem, a single brain cell doesn't come up with a solution, though it can participate in one. The process of thinking happens at a level higher than just individual brain cells. It happens through them. Similarly, there's no way that we personally can fix the mess our world is in, but the process of healing and recovery at a planetary level can happen through us and what, through what we do. For this to happen, we need to play our part. That's where power with comes in the helping hand of grace. All the individuals on a team may each be brilliant by themselves, but if they don't shift their story from personal success to team success, their net effectiveness will be greatly reduced. When people experience themselves as part of a group with a shared purpose, team spirit flows through them and their central organizing principle changes. The guiding question moves from, what can I gain to what can I give? We can develop a similar team spirit with life. When we are guided by our willingness to find and play our part, we can feel as if we are acting not just alone, but as a part of a larger team of life that acts with us and through us. Since this team involves many other players, unsuspected allies can emerge at crucial moments. Unseen helpers can remove obstacles we didn't even know were there. When we're guided by questions such as, what can I offer and what can I give? We might sometimes play the role of stepping out in front and at other times that of being the ally giving support. Either way, we think of the additional support behind our actions as a form of grace. Based on an interview with Joanna, this poem, edited into verse by Tom Atlee, founder of the Co-Intelligence Institute, expresses well the grace that comes from belonging to life. When you act on behalf of something greater than yourself, you begin to feel it acting through you with a power that is greater than your own. This is grace. Today, as we take risks for the sake of something greater than our separate individual lives, we are feeling graced by other beings and by the earth itself. Those with whom and on whose behalf we act give us strength and eloquence and staying power we didn't know we had. We just need to practice knowing that and remembering that we are sustained by each other. In the web of life, our true power comes as a gift like grace because in truth it is sustained by others. If we practice drawing on the wisdom and beauty and strengths of our fellow human beings and our fellow species, we can go into any situation and trust that the courage and intelligence required will be supplied.
And actually, Diego, that's where on our syllabus this one ends. I kept, I personally wanted to keep reading it <laughs> when I saw it ended here. I was like, no. But that just gives us incentive to check out this book um, on our own because it has some good insight. Um, let's see, 642. How are we feeling? Do we want to tackle a third reading? Can I get a, a pulse check with the group? You're up for it, Diego? How, how are people you up for it, Cascade? Okay, I think it's only five pages. And um, we will work through it and then come back around and talk about some of these interesting things that have been brought up. Um, okay. Okay. This one, uh, we start at more and more. Um, I became beset with power. More and more, I became beset with power what it is, how it is gendered, what it means in our lives and how we approach it. I observed how throughout history, men have conceptualized power to work in their favor. The typical patriarchal understanding of power has three common characteristics. First, power is tied to the state and its institutions, the government, military, parliament, local constituencies, and so on, which are all male dominated. Second, Euro patriarchal knowledge defines power in ways that are synonymous with terms such as dominance, authority, violence, oppression, and coercion words that may be related to power, but are not precisely the same thing. These definitions are then solidified through socio-cultural practices that reinforce patriarchal meanings of power, cultural depictions of power, whether in film, photography, literature, or paintings, feature typical representations of heroic, Machiavellian patriarchal men, such as James Bond or the Black Panther, or old photographs of African kings with their multiple wives and slaves surrounding them, or panegyrics to mafia bosses in rap songs or Casanovas surrounded by objectified women in advertisements or navel gazing tech bros in Silicon Valley. The list is endless. The equation of power with dominance and coercion becomes obvious in academic writing. The political scientist Robert A. Dahl's formula of power is perhaps the most widely taught definition of the notion. Quote, A a has power over B to the extent that he can get B to do something that B would not otherwise do. This definition comes at the expense of other understandings of power where, for instance, A affects B in a manner in accordance with B's interests or A affects A in their own interests or A's and B's decisions positively affect the rest of the alphabet, or most thankfully, where we stop speaking about power in terms of A and B at all. Not only did Dahl equate power with dominance, but he also defined it formulaically, which brings me to the third patriarchal definition of power power as a measurable concept. If A dot dot dot, then B. Power is something that can be traded like money, traded like currency. 
This is what another major voice in the definition of power. Talcott Parsons, who argues in Power, Critical Concepts, edited by John Scott, that power is the generalized capacity to secure the performances of binding obligations by units in a system of collective organization when the obligations are legitimized with reference to their bearing on collective goals and where in case of recalcitrance, there is a presumption of enforcement for negative situational sanctions, whatever the actual agency of that enforcement. The abstract writing hardly makes it clear, but what Parsons was arguing is that power circulates and is analogous to money because it is a medium of exchange. In other words, Parsons too was quantifying power. It is an undertaking that may be suited to academic purposes, but for those of us who have to fight for the power to govern our own lives, it is a one size fits all measurement that is incompatible with real life struggles. Dahl and Parsons are far from the only thinkers who have turned power into a measurable entity. The psychologists John R. P. French and Betram Raven categorized power into five distinct, quote, points of power, coercive power, reward power, legitimate power, expert power, and referent power. Political theorist Stephen Lukes sees three dimensions of power, which he classifies as decision-making power, agenda-setting power, and ideological power. Inasmuch as white men dominate the theorizing about power, it is no surprise that the same three characteristics can be traced at least to Renaissance philosopher Niccolo, Nic Niccolo Machiavelli's treatise on the topic, The Prince. With the exception of philosophers such as Hannah Arendt and Mary Parker Follett, few women and hardly any people of color have had a significant influence on mainstream conceptualizations of power. Although power has, of course, been a critical topic in progressive movements. When we do come across a female thinker in the mainstream, mainstream canon, such as Arendt, whose theoretical approach to power is not exclusively tied to the state, is not conceptualized as dominance or, or coercion, and is not measurable per se. She is predictably accused of being out of line with the central meanings of power, as Luke's claims that Arendt is in power a radical view. As Arendt wrote in On Violence, quote, Power springs up whenever people get together and act in concert. And violence, quote, ends in power's disappearance. To speak of nonviolent power is therefore redundant, as power is always nonviolent. Follett defined power in a pragmatic feminist way as being, quote, power with which is based on solidarity and collaboration and enables the multiplication of individual talents and knowledge rather than quote power over, which seeks to undermine others. In my view, power is not A nor B. Quote power to, quote power over, or even necessarily quote power with. Necessary as power with is, it would be more accurately described as, collab as collaboration or solidarity. I prefer to say quite simply, power is. I would like to explore power, therefore, as a phenomenon rather than a system, to understand it by observing it rather than by measuring it. This way, 
I will later also be able to observe if power has patterns. As a phenomenon, power is a kind of force reminiscent of what the Yoruba refer to as ashe, the Hindu as prana, and Japanese Shinto worshippers as kami. Ashe is a philosophical concept that describes a quality that is imminent in everything, humans, nature, songs, food. And without which there would be entropy. Prana, as Guru Swami Satyanada Saraswati said, is not merely, quote, the breath, air, or oxygen, as modern yogis have heard. Precisely and scientifically speaking, Saraswati wrote in Yoga, in yoga magazine, prana means the original life force. The Shinto concept of kami refers to the complex energy system and the sacred essence within natural elements, deities, humans, places, and even objects. Insofar as power is a phenomenon and an observable force, it has qualities of intentionality that are connoted by ashi, prana, and kami. Power itself is neither female nor male, but women and men relate to power differently. The gendered language with which we speak about power is symptomatic of an antecedent to the gendered inequality in our structure of power. To change the structure, the, power, the narrative of power must itself be boldly reimagined. As the current structure of power is based on Europatriarchal knowledge, the reimagining of power should be based on knowledge that includes all life, that which is immeasurable, embodied, sentient, fertile, indigenous, non-Eurocentric, decolonial, and feminist, sensuous knowledge. Also, for any redefining of power to have value in the 21st century, it must be concerned with how power is entangled with nature. Nature is a source of existential meaning or a domain of analysis, as feminist philosopher Sandra Harding argues in her excellent essay, Women's Standpoints on Nature. If one must measure power at all, the barometer, which, uh, which be what I call exousence, a term I am coining from the ancient Greek word exousia, which means power, to describe ex, I'm not even, I don't know if sure I'm saying this correctly, but exosians think of edentric patterns, which are the vast and continuing patterns that can be found in the bodies of all humans, animals, and everywhere in nature, and which are characterized, but I'll refer to as branching. Consider, for example, how a branch of a river breaks off from the main body of water and then into smaller branches, which further break into even smaller branches. Or think of the branches of a tree, the veins in a leaf, the capillaries in living tissue, the air passages in our lungs, cor coral reefs, neurons, or lightning, all share the same dendritic pattern. Each of these fractal-like phenomena can be categorized by their branching quality, which is, most, which is part of connectedness and reciprocity, as well as their autonomy and self-realization. You could say that power has the same branching system, it has a center of concentration from where it erupts, but it, as it branches out, it expands and multiplies, stretching outward in self-mirroring patterns as many times as possible until a branch ends, ends become so thin that, it, that the process ceases, only to begin in another dendritic pattern within the ecosystem. Even when one particular cluster appears to end, its roots and function provide another cluster with capacity to repeat the same process. Yet, other, yet each group pushes towards its own completion as it meets obstacles in the way of the process. There is a tremendous amount of autonomous and reciprocal life force in each branching. This entire process illustrates exousance the better the obstacles, the better that obstacles are overcome, the more exusions an, an organism, individual or collective, can be said to have. And like the chicken and the egg question, which came first? It is impossible to know 
if the branch as the source branch is the one that pushes forth power, or if it is a second or third or fourth branch that births itself. All we can see is that this branching process is surrounded by urge and determination, by a passionate longing to manifest and be thrust into existence. That is power in pure form. With this imagery, we witness power as it is. Power is the individual and the collective enmeshed and separate existing together and individually in constant movement. Were you to apply exousience to a scenario where you, you felt powerless, for example, a boss expecting too much of you, a racist coming up with excuses not to provide you a service, or a lover being unreliable, when you employ exousience, instead of feeling depleted, you understand events within the many branches of your journey and how they all converge toward a goal. One part of your life is not working, but others might be. You are able to observe yourself as a holistic organism within an interconnected ecosystem and resolve to move forward. Similarly, when it comes to groups of people, exousience recognizes the external will of the group as well as the interior of it, which results in powerful focus rather than a powerless lack of clarity. The independent process of exousience is depicted perfectly in the surrealist paintings of nature by the Nigerian artist Abayomi Barber, works that at first glance seem strictly mystical because they convey den dendritic branches of trees shape-shifting into human silhouettes or animal contours and shadows of nudes that are fecund with mystery. But the more one studies Barber's work, the more the appreciation of fractals so typical to African culture suggests, quote, power is a wild yet focused phenomenon as it winds its way under, above, around, or through our perceived reality, assuredly like gravity. A river is never still. When it meets an obstruction, it moves under, above, around, or through whatever prevents it from flowing. When blocked, a river revolts with all its weight, including that of the streams and tributaries that pour into it until it flows smoothly again. Rivers flow down mountains, valleys, and plateaus. They flow into lakes, ponds, and seas. With the help of gravity, they swirl, surge, and push toward their final destination, the ocean. Power is to humans what gravity is to rivers. It is the vital force that helps us flow through the meandering streams of life. It is what gets us out of bed in the morning. It is equally the tool with which we build movements, affect change, and counter oppression. Power is the kernel of human achievement. Just as the river aims towards the ocean, so do two. So, yeah, so do two. So, to do. <laughs> Humans strive towards our ultimate goal, self-actualization. You might refer to call the de destiny where the streams of our desires converge by a different name, contentment, enlightenment, purpose, fulfillment, equipoise, no fucks given, whatever you like. But I favor psychologist Abraham Maslow's way of putting it in this famous essay about the pyramid of human needs, a theory of human motivation. Quote, a musician must make music, an artist must paint, a poet, poet must write, if he is to be ultimately at peace with himself. What a man can be, he must be. This need, um, I think that's it for the reading, actually. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> wow, it just ended on a need. No, I think we were, we were probably supposed to stop at human achievement and I just didn't catch it, but um, cool. We did it. Um, wow. 
lots of good stuff in this these readings right i was really like i got lit up when i previewed these like there's a lot of good stuff um I'll just I'll repeat and put my questions in the chat, but I just definitely want to open it up and hear your guys's reflections in general. Um, Hannah Ardent, I saw uh, Emily loves. I'd love to hear more about her perspective on power. Uh, the questions I had, just to remind you, let me just paste them before I. Did I paste them? Yeah, cool. All right, is just. Um, Going all the way back to the free talk, thinking about in what ways organizations can have a willingness to be disturbed. Talked about how um, you can't change uh, living systems, but you can disturb them. And to create space for change, nonlinear emergence. Um, second question is, in what ways can we cultivate a power with mentality, which Joanna Macy talks a lot about within our communities of practice. And the third, which was helping me to think about was what are some of the larger social movements that are, are seemingly small actions are a part of, like that newspaper example, the dots and the whole. Um, so those are the questions I have, but I will open it up. I could share something if it's okay. Yes. <laughs> uh, just something that came up in my mind when the Hannah Arendt uh, and the conversation on power came up. Something that I remembered from her book on violence that was mentioned is she had a notion that I had never considered before, which about power, which was, you know, we often think of violence as the evidence and the arm of power that the powerful are the ones who can hurt and you know bring out the guns and the violence and control through violence but she has this provocative idea that she says actually when violence is engaged that's the absence of power if one truly is powerful, then they, they don't need to rely on violence to embody power. And I just had never considered that before. And I thought it was a pretty provocative kind of feminist flip on the whole notion. And so I just thought I'd put that out there as a little kernel first thought. And I also just really enjoyed the concept in the reading tonight about what was it? Maybe you could clarify, Kelly, something about dis disturbing uh, the disturbance of systems rather than systems just changing. I, th I thought that was a really interesting idea. Um, anyway, so just a few little thoughts there. Thank you, Emily. Go ahead, Lauren. I can kind of follow on that thought just because I've been um, thinking a lot about the this critical anniversary that we're coming up to on Saturday of the 20th anniversary of 9-11 and kind of trying to think about what, what happened there. Um, and the idea of disturbance um, sort of is something 
that I think is still kind of resonating in the system, um, the system of politics and the patriarchal um, um, power structure uh, that we struggle within. Um, to follow that, you know, just a little bit kind of more, you know, the, 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 att the attack itself was so symbolic on the targets that were hit that day of the financial and military um, buildings uh, and places of power. Um, and of course, the immediate response within a few weeks was to invade Afghanistan. But on a systemic level, there was definitely a kind of deep beginning of change um, that may take a lot longer and be a lot less clear to articulate than, than the direct costs of the war on terror or the uh, direct objectives to um, create a state of exception, which was what um, Bush uh, and his political elite claimed right after 9-11 that the exceptional nature of the um, mass murders of 3,000 US-based, um, well, they were actually people from all around the world, but the th 3,000 people who were mass murdered um, um, was sent him into declaring a state of exception, which means that he didn't have to rule by the laws of democracy. And that state of exception um, allowed him to make decisions that that we can analyze as good or bad, but the fact that he declared a state of exception proves that Osama bin Laden created a disturbance that created change because the state of exception itself um, is probably the most profound thing that will have the longest consequences um, in this place that we um, live in that we enjoy things we think of as democracy. A little bit of a provocation there to have a conversation, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll just say that I have just been learning about this um, state of exception. And what I'm realizing that it allowed happen was the gathering of unprecedented levels of data. So the surveillance state <laughs> was able to fully come into itself after 9-11 because there was this like urgency. So now we're still dealing with the ramifications of, of that. And then um, permitting torture also and just that. <laughs> so yeah, it's, uh, I feel like it's interesting the dis concept of disturbance can be both a destructive or constructive phenomenon in, in the world and in nature and in, you know, so it's, it's just interesting how in this case, there was a disturbance by targeting these points of patriarchal power that then kind of amplified this patriarchal <laughs> response, which is, yeah, deeply affecting us today is what I'm, I'm coming to terms with how deeply it's affecting us today. Um, so. Also just to um, speak to the state of exception really briefly, it, I also think like, from reading a uh, state of exception by Agamben, it he makes an interesting point that 
it seems like state of exception is also just law itself in the way that um, law creates itself and is therefore always outside of itself because it's superior, but it doesn't need to adhere to itself. And in that way, it's almost as if 9-11, rather than creating a state of exception, just revealed the ways in which democracy is actually just a state of exception, where there are people that are constantly evading the law while simultaneously creating the law. And those people are just the figureheads of capitalism and law and governance. Um, and yeah, and through that, I totally agree, Kelly, like surveillance um, is one of the biggest examples of that where surveillance existed before in the form of policing, of course, in the carceral system. Um, but after 9-11, it allowed the permeation of it into like our pockets and everything we do is being, it's like, just become a different kind of big brother state. It's really scary. <laughs> yeah, I thought those readings paired together so well and the idea of disturbance creating a vacuum. Um, and then the points that you're bringing up is the idea that when there's a vacuum, the conditions are ripe for the abuse of power. And we see that overreach happening following disturbances and to be ready to identify and rise to confront that is, I think, the important call to action of some of these readings. And it's very complicated because we're like, if we're, whoever here is like a citizen um, or has some kind of like benefits from the state, we're always in a form of like implicit agreement with the state of exception and the ways we're being governed. Even thinking about the ways that like, when we vote, what does that mean? How are, how is that in relation to the state of exception? Like, does that mean that we're in support of the ways we're being? Um, and I'm not, I'm not trying to like, say that no one should vote. <laughs> I'm just saying it's it's good to think about the ways that like, at least for me, that's been something I've been reckoning with a lot is how do I as a citizen, what does that mean as a participant, as somebody who benefits, like Lauren was saying, from these things that we call democracy. It makes it hard to think of ways to act sometimes, which coming back to Hannah Arendt, um, in her one of her books, she talks about how evil, the banality of evil, and how evil is just thoughtlessness, like when we refuse to act with thinking um, and with thought. And so I think she would say not to not act, but to act thoughtfully in this case against power or through power. So Izzy, I just want to, that's such a... Uh a real argument that folks that I know, especially younger folks, that why they're not voting when, you know, people who are very righteous, which I would include myself sometimes <laughs> about voting, that you're buying into the existing system if you do that, right? Um, I just, uh, I would, I want to really appreciate as a country, I was down in Mexico when I, when on the 20, on September 11th that year, and what was interesting you know, obviously there was so much going on, but we couldn't get back in over, you know, for like five days. So it was just observing from a non, not being on American soil, watching the perspective of how, you know, Americans were acting and the shock and surprise that for folks who realize what an imperiously based nation the U.S. is, are not surprised in some ways. And just, that was, and so my perspective from the beginning was that it was actually not a surprise, but it's been sanctioned and bought into that whole thing ever since. Homeland Security was operating, it was created in a response and is just like a norm now, you know, in a democratic 
watching a democratic president that we that many of us had elected go in and murder someone almost on live television and everyone cheering is something what never would have happened before that you know i'm going to put a there's a an amazing woman named who's a sikh uh named valerie Carr. you may some of you may know her she's got a whole learning hub on this about how it's been institutionalized through all these different ways i just want to say one thing about when not stopping the reading um as you said kelly is that i thought it was very interesting that the first sentence of where you said we were supposed to stop was about the river going back to the ocean and how so much of the you know the work that metabolic and lauren is doing on bending the river like that was actually the most important couple of sentences <laughs> that it that it didn't get stopped there i thought it was so perfect so that's <laughs> But one thing, I, another exception, when I was when when you were reading about you know phenomena and exceptions, and I was thinking about current days, like the term "I can't breathe" and that the prevalence of that in so many of the different. I know that's been talked about when we we're talking about climate change and fire too, but just the lifting up of that term and how it brings us, you know, through so many different areas of the interconnection of all that, I, 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 that's kind of uh, a national of movements, I think. And I can think of like AOC, her response to the Senate hearings and, you know, just things that have sparked movements of people that were just ready to go, you know, that's another form that's kind of one of your questions. So that's it, that's all. <laughs> it was, I love this, these, these readings, it was fabulous, thank you. I think there's something so important and mysterious in this act of questioning the definition of power. Because I know how prevalent it is, the male-dominated way of describing it, demonstrating it, and and in my little corner of the pixel of the whole picture, I've been working on this opera for a long time now. And <laughs> there's a man and a woman who are both protagonists in it. And the, the problem of showing power in a woman, what is that? It, you know, in the movies, when they show a woman has become strong and powerful, it's like she's kicking everybody's teeth in, which is just exactly replicating a, <laughs> a masculine definition of power. And I think that it's going to be this questioning of the definition of power is one of those one plus one and a, equals two and a bit that there's, there's going to be a chance at some point for that, since all of the, the institutions are crumbling and seem like old, old news. I mean, all those definitions of power just seem like really old news of like, I can do this to you, like with my club and my bone tool, you know, it's like, There's a simultaneous emergence happening, I think, and I feel like from hearing these readings that maybe at the heart of it is this questioning that a critical mass of extremes that we're in, that, that one of them will allow this other kind of understanding to have its place to take its place its own power of understanding that is not what how we've defined it before and i think meanwhile we have to use the tools at hand and vote and do blah 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 and i don't have any hope that any one politician is the greatest person but it's it's the boat we're in right now. So yeah, keep it patched up, keep it going like that until the whole thing shifts. I mean, we really are going through a paradigm shift and just just to keep, I just wanna put some juice in that area, the idea of the 
questioning of all of these definitions right now that are in the air. Well, before we go to uh, our current events, um, I just wanted to um, introduce our next uh, learning and mending um, syllabus, which is building, will be building on some of these themes of surveillance and what we can do about it, <laughs> namely commoning. Um, and it's being uh, designed by Iz Izzy. So, um, uh, in about a month, we have another we have another two or three readings from this series, um, um, and then we'll have a week break, and then Izzy will pick up. And I wonder, Izzy, if you could say a couple words about what you're working on. Yeah, definitely, I would be happy to. Um, so this next series um, was fueled by my research with Lauren on 9-11 and surveillance and the state of exception. Um, and at first it kind of started down that route. And then as I was working on the syllabus I, uh, for learning and mending was thinking about, instead of looking at uh, this surveillance directly in the state of exception, but like Lauren said, looking at what we can do about it and looking at uh, texts that are kind of focused on instances of commoning, uh, communal insurrectionary agriculture projects and um, relationships that we can have with the soil. Um, and so it's kind of building off of a lot of the conversations we had before with Anna Singh and in the suffocation series. It touches on a lot of the topics from all of the learning and mending series so far, and I'm really excited for it. Um, a lot of it will be about care work too and community. So looking forward to it and I'm excited and hope you guys are also. <laughs> and thank you, Lauren, for giving us all this opportunity to learn together. It's gonna be really fun to continue. Thank you, Izzy. Thanks, Izzy. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> Should we go to current, current events? Current events time. All right. Bobby. I will take it away and share my screen just a second. OK. So we got three articles for this week. Uh, all right. So this one kind of seems a little bit trivial, but um, a, okay, article from Forbes about what the Free Britney movement teaches about the power of community. It really ties back into our readings as well. And I'll kind of, kind of connect that back in, but um, this article really talks about the power of social media and the, the public to drive real change. Um, and it's actually led to a lot of conversations around the topic of conservatorship too. Um, so kind of going back into our own I, you know, kind of going back to the, the readings today, the PPP, uh, people have power on their own, but the power becomes unstoppable when joined in with the community. So during kind of like, you know, backstory, I think if anybody doesn't know about the Britney Spears uh, situation with, um, I think kind of back in 2018, uh, she had the kind of well publicized mental breakdown and her father took control of her finances and, and personal life through a conservatorship. And now more than dec you know, a couple decades later, um, you know, she's having a really s s uh, stable life, thriving career and stable mental health as well, that her father's still in conservatorship, but he's now petitioned to kind of remove himself as well. But um, this article really kind of dived into why this movement really worked. And I think there's something that worked that kind of at the heart of it is that nostalgia is a major driver. And so with people, you know, being kind of being introduced to Britney Spears music as an international pop, a pop culture icon, spans multiple generations. Uh, and so the people that they kind of got kind of engaged in this campaign was really wide and uh, really unifying people through a simplified message through a hashtag and people could really understand what was going on with the you know, just, just the hashtag alone. Um, 
and uh, people from all across the globe show the support in online and in-person demonstrations. My even my even my um, local news channel ran a week-long investigation into conservatorship laws and how they're impacting aging adults who have been who have court appointed to conservatorships. Um, these companies who are appointed by the court to control their finances and it's an industry that's largely unregulated. Um, and it's managing over $13 billion of other people's assets in California alone. Um, so just kind of, a, you know, this leads to just not just about conversations around writing itself, but the conversation about conservatorships as well, um, even led to Congress, uh, members of Congress in, in uh, introducing a bill proposing protections for people under such legal arrangements. Um, I think it was D Democratic Representative Charlie Crist of uh, Florida and it Republican of South Carolina introduced, uh, presented the Freedom and Right to Emancipate from Exploitation Act uh, to allow people under legal guardianship or conservatorship the right to petition the court to have their court guardian or court appointed guardian replaced by a, a public guardian. Um, and this is kind of this is fascinating. Kind of let me down a rabbit hole, but kind of investigating why a court appointed uh, conservatorship might be um, applied is where there's a situation with. Um, uh, the, uh, the um, uh, kind of siblings fighting against the kind of a, the uh, the what to do with the parents and especially when and, and when they're facing dementia and other uh, stages of, of life or um, even uh, cases that or arbitration cases and other things like that um, where it kind of falls downhill but it just fascinating to learn that this is an industry that's running that's really kind of untalked about and unknown as well that sometimes even people are tricked into getting conservatorships as well and people controlling their finances um and kind of tying it back into our or actually one last thing about the the, the forbes article was and since it is forbes we're talking about what their business can learn from the free britney campaign this is kind of uh, highlighting the power of community and the cumulative voices of communities power to shape policy and designing products and now that consumers the power has also shifted to the consumer as well um, but kind of tying it back to our reading this the central knowledge as well especially uh, the, the mary parker fillet uh fillet uh, quote that power with um and based on solidarity and collaboration and enables the multiplication of individual talents and knowledge rather than power over which seeks to undermine others um, and with the act of hope reading um, it's not the power of the individual but the collective to make things happen if we are not only motivated uh we can mobilize inter you know if, if we're only motivated enough to mobilize for international pop stars who idolize as teens maybe we could drive meaningful change on climate change as well and getting folks behind a similar message and kind of driving on these things that worked for a similar campaign and and has such ripple effects um, through society as well. Um, another article is this kind of a, a, a book, a, a preview to a book from a professor at uh, Cornell, uh, Vanessa Bones of the, the Social Psychologist, the Department of Organizational Behavior. Um, and the book is titled, You May Have More Influence Than You Know. Um, it really kind of goes into talking about, uh, uh, we are, have a lot of influence in our day-to-day -day lives, but we're actually overlooking it. And you know, based on different psychological biases that cause us to regularly miss the influence we see um, and to com kind of co combat misinformation, sexual harassment, racial discrimination, other forms of uh, misconduct, we must recognize our own role in uh, perpetuating and condoning these things and take responsibility for the influence that we have. Um, and kind of the, the, the summary to take away from the book, the author kind of says that uh, I want readers to be mindful of the impact they have on other people every day and to do so in sort of a influence audit in order to ensure their impact is a positive one. And kind of going back to our readings uh, with especially the act of hope reading uh, that um, every everything we do has ripples of influence extending far beyond what we can see and that action may have may be seen as inconsequential by itself adds to other interactions as others so when we're thinking about kind of influence especially as it relates to our own decisions as an individual to you know determine the way we live that contributes to healing our climate we can influence others in the way that we have make our own impacts and so kind of like really kind of honing in the idea of that that um 
in our you know our everyday little lives and what we can do with our own decisions that can possibly influence others and, and especially we don't think about the influence we have others and we're especially seeing that in the reading about our um, kind of messaging it's not the volume or the frequency but it's the meaningfulness of uh, others and, and caroline and i had a conversation this week it was really fascinating about kind of like you know we had those moments when you um remember a small thing that somebody said that might have seemed in you know, incredibly meaningless to them, but you kind of held on to, but you, know, you kind of think about and marinate in your brain for a while. It's kind of those ideas of, you know, in, in passing conversation, a lot, a lot of things that we could be saying may have maybe influencing others and, and kind of thinking about that holistically as well. Um, lastly, we've got a, uh, a uh, New York Times uh, opinion article, uh, Lauren Trier uh, last week about the most wonderful spelling time of the year. And this is a kind of really fun article, uh, opinion piece by uh, David George uh, Hassel, a biologist, author, and professor, and really kind of dives into the power of smell and sense. And, and it's not just in humans, but the natural world around us. Um, that smell of it kind of goes into the idea of smelling Christmas trees triggering memories for us instantly. And to quote from the article that it's a portal into the past open by odor alone. And it's, it's, it's smell is something unlike any of the other senses because it's so direct. The smell bypasses the neural processing centers that meditate all of the centers mediate all of the senses when we breathe signals run along nerves wired straight to the paths of the brains governing emotional memory and associative learning um the kind of like language of, of smell is kind of connected to also forest and trees these kind of chemical conversations that are happening between cells in the air and waterborne air aromatic uh, molecules that are, that are kind of uniting all living beings kind of going from our noses from the roots and tips of the things so it's kind of like you know just connecting between even the soil and the trees that kind of scent that kind of uh, pulls us pull, pulls it all together um and let's see there's all the article or the opinion piece also kind of talks about uh, uh plants using um odors to actually uh, odor molecules to defend themselves from insects and fungi to cope with heat stress to, li to listen to the health of other plants and some some in parasitic and insects um there's you know, fruits that have aromatic uh, oils and alcohols to deter bacteria and uh, other uh, other animals and kind of the unique aroma of each species that kind of blend together and create this olfactory kind of combination of other things. Uh, so kind of thinking about the way that our kind of you know, our senses kind of create this landscape around us, and especially it's deeply rooted to uh, our own history as human beings. And you know, with culture, um, there's deep uh, kind of significance in certain sense that kind of tie back into our, our own kind of memories and uh, the kind of the power of scent itself as well. And going back to our sensuous reading texts, um, kind of talking about the reimagining of power, and it should be based on knowledge that includes all life, and that, that is, uh, which is immeasurable, embodied, sentient, fertile, indigenous, and non-Eurocentric, decolonial, and feminist. Uh, the power is entangled with nature. And so kind of, kind of step back from our anthropocentric view uh, we can see the power of the natural world from flora and fauna that are all connected by scent. Um, the power in this case is the scent, the soil, the tree, the water that connects the trees, the soil bacteria, the birds, the animals. It's our own kind of connection with forests and traditions and cultures that kind of really invoke strong memories within us. So I really found that fascinating and, and kind of thinking about other ways of power, um, especially not just in our, you know, human world, but in the world around us too, especially with animals and, and plants and and how that's also used, or scent is also used for that. So that's it. that's it for current events this week. And I'll show the articles uh, down in the chat as well. Thanks, Kavi. Yeah. And I have to go, but good night, everyone, and thanks so much. Good night. Thank you. Lori, someone talked about what's happening with bending the river and the the next week because I've been seeing all this incredible stuff on your social. I know you're doing the sound thing for 9-11 over the weekend, which is magical. But um uh, we, like a critical point happening soon, right? <laughs> um it's just trudging the road to happy destiny. <laughs>
<laughs> We're continuing to trudge that road. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you for asking. But yes, I'm doing a, um, to, together with Sonic Division, I'm doing a um, sound piece that will begin early tomorrow morning and last for 3,000 minutes, which is rough, roughly 50 uh, 50 hours, and it's meant to help us embody and experience um, the figure of 3,000 by attributing one minute to every uh, person who uh, died upon impact of the airplanes uh, that hit the World Trade Center towers, the Pentagon, and that landed out in the fields. Um, and the piece is um, um, an analog uh, uh, composition that Douglas Lee uh, made for this occasion that um, is played on a glass crystal um, and then that piece is sent through the silo where I am not now, but where I'm nearby. <laughs> um, and then the sound of the silo, the sound it makes in the silo is what you hear on the radio. And then that sound is um, looped through the silo. And every time it's looped, it becomes um, uh, slowed down by half. So it's it becomes almost an abstract drone. Um, and that goes on, um, that will go on for, as I said, 3,000 minutes. And uh, our other Sonic Division collaborator, Aaron, is going to go into a deep meditation starting now. He just drove in. Uh, he's going to sit in the silo for, for 3,000 minutes and try and do as little as possible. It's going to be about deep listening but he's going to be adding a kind of diurnal wave pattern um, to live to the sound. And um, that's, that's what we're up to. So um, at the, at the end of that, there'll be a public um, recitation of more of the figures that, that, that around nine 11, um, on the Brooklyn Rail format, and um, Emily Lacey will be live DJing that reading. So some of the um, voices that participate, it's a, it's a recitation for eight voices. So um, those figures will be read into the silo and also be partly transformed through Emily's intuitive faculties. Uh, <laughs> So that will be on Sunday at nine o'clock uh, in the, no, yeah, I think, I don't know. I think it's at nine o'clock, is it? Anyway, it'll be in the morning sometime and you can register on Eventbrite. Yeah, it. I, I will say that, that for me, 9-11 um, as even a, as even as a figure, you know, the, the fact that we have a, a kind of name for an event that we call 9-11 is a fascinating thing. Um, and the gap between the looping visual image of the World Trade Center towers coming down and the analysis, the conversation, the assimilation and the synthesis of what actually happened is so large that um, this piece of, of work kind of comes from really wanting to um, bear witness to um, th this incredibly, I think, impactful moment in the story of the emergence of cultural identity. And I think that emergence, to come back to that idea, is a is a process. I don't think it's immediately like like we learn about soil building. Um, it it takes time and it takes effort and it takes many components to create the emergence of change. Um, so so I'm, I'm interested in that and I'm interested in 
that in its relationship to sound and especially sound in a highly disturbed um, playa, uh, connecting them in that way. That's where the silo is. So I hope that that isn't too long an answer. Yeah. Uh, Perfect. But thank you for asking, Laura. Yeah. There's quite a few people that, you know, there, there's this season of nonviolence that's been happening from Gandhi's birthday to September to the International Day of Peace on September 21st. And ever since 9-11, September 11th has been like a really high point. There's a lot of consciousness and spiritual communities that are doing stuff around that. So I'm just going to send this to those who might be interested. Yeah. There might be some resonance. <laughs> yeah, please do. The, the sound that the sound is really um, compelling just to listen to even without the, the narrative. I, I think it really works. So some, some of you might enjoy it. Well, we'll, we'll um, see you next week. I next think. week. Yeah, we have two more, two more readings in this series. And next week is about <laughs> appropriately the interconnectedness of the world's problems. So, <laughs> so we'll, we'll reconnect then. Perfect. And I also just wanted to give a shout out to learning and mending because this piece uh, that we're doing um, probably wouldn't be what it is without the learning and mending research <laughs> um, and the importance that we are attributing to actually learning together and mending together without necessarily being experts at it. So I especially wanted to thank you all for the um, time and space to explore these things and talk about them. And um, in particular, thank Izzy for her research on the, um, the figures uh, for 9-11 and and also to thank Emily for working so hard this week to turn that research into a spoken word recitation. So it's a real team team effort here, <laughs> um, uh, including all, all of you here that um, make space for this kind of inquiry. Thanks, Lauren. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thank you so much for this space. I feel the same way, I really do. See you guys next week. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Lauren. Thank Thanks, you, everybody. Thank Have a good night. Bye. 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 Bye.